Welcome, everyone, to the Tons of Productions podcast on this Monday, July 22nd, 2019. Today, I talk with three different people from Creative BC. My interview last week was with Marnie Orr, and she asked around the office if anyone was interested in talking to me. And lucky for me, there was three people that came forward. So, my, the first person I interview is Catherine Pavoni. She is a motion picture industry and community affairs specialist, and it is a great interview. So, here you go. Here's Catherine Pavoni. You are listening to the Tons of Productions podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, I course. really appreciate it. I uh, love to talk to people who are, um, well, in the film industry as much as you uh, have been. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this for, for quite a while, right? This is... Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I would say that my first foray into filmmaking would have been when I was about 16. My older brother was a grip slash uh, aspiring director. Oh, okay. And on the weekends, I used to come into Toronto. Um, I'm originally from Niagara, Ontario, so I was born in St. Catharines. So we drive back and forth to Toronto. My brother's seven years older than me. And uh, he had a couple short films that I helped out on, and it was like, oh, my goodness, this is so fun. Oh, yeah. Like, I got to hang out with, like, tons of dudes, and <laughs> there was tons of food, <laughs> and people were fun and You made good and money? Creative. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no? I, I was definitely working for free. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was only 16, so I shouldn't be on any payroll, That's really. That's true. It's 18, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And then you have to have an agent yeah, and all yeah. that. Yeah, I was mostly just hanging out. So, But, yeah, I've been doing it, you know right from high school into college and then so you think because you, your brother is that that type of person you same type of personality where go 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 say yes every time yeah i mean i think well my sister was is also an actress and so from a very young age we sort of had been around my, my parents don't from the background at all like they're not in film um but my sister was born to be an actress straight out of the gate so she um started doing commercials and theater and a bunch of stuff when she was young and then as kids we were like well we want to do whatever we're here in bc no back in ontario back oh in yeah ontario. yeah you're from toronto right yeah. is yeah. that what you said from i'm toronto. from london that's yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah so we would uh i even did some like child acting i was in oh. commercials yeah hideous with all the hair <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i would say that they inspired me obviously to get into it but it was it was an easy in for me because i was just one of those people that like i constantly wanted to be on and moving and solving problems and being with people and it was just not a regular job right which i never pictured myself doing even from a young age right um so i think that that's why it was an easy you know path well, you're so lucky take. i'm jealous because i i didn't discover film until i was like 37 right or i was right. older and then i realized oh my god i should have when I was a kid or something or when I was 20 <laughs> yeah. this is ridiculous but then you didn't burn yourself out by the time you were 37 right. <laughs> that's the other thing working what is it 10 years over 10 years on set yeah. you did yeah so you worked a lot of hours yeah I, yeah I sure did yeah for sure it especially was... near the end there you know get well, I mean actually I shouldn't say that it was definitely worse when I was starting out I was like music videos and always juggling two or three jobs at once kind of thing um uh but then you're young enough to do it yeah yeah you can keep going keep going absolutely um one of the last jobs i did on set was van driver for locations and yeah, you know they're ours uh, yeah i i only <laughs> did i think about five months and then i got married and then i quit working on set and right. was sort of working for uh, a place that got uh, parallel got bought by oh, whites yeah, yeah. so it was a locations rental kind yeah. of place oh excellent and they knew me from uh, independent films so they hired me right away amazing, amazing. yeah it was really cool yeah. how uh if you're in the industry here for a while, I don't know what it's like in Toronto, but here it seems that everyone helps everyone out. Everyone, you know, and if you need a job or you need anything, oh, well, you know, I've had friends offer me, come work for electrics. I'm like, I'm not an electrician. <laughs> and they're like, well, you'll carry cable. Yeah. Exactly. Like what? I'll <laughs> oh, just sign up. You'll carry cable. I, yeah. It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, realistically, there's a job for everyone. It doesn't really matter what your interests are because there's always a department that's going to sort of fit it. And if it doesn't fit it at the beginning, once you learn a little bit, it, it, you know, molds itself to whatever your kind of interests are, um, which is another thing that's so cool about film because 
it doesn't matter what your background is or where your education is or where you came from or what you were doing before. Once you're in the fold, you're part of the family and right. it's easy to be passed from person to person. And I, it's a weird thing about film people because some people, you know, they can be really grumpy and standoffish to start with, but they love teaching. Like right. ask someone about their craft and even they, they could be the, you know, the meanest looking dude on set and you ask them a question. They love talking about themselves. <laughs> podcast um <laughs> hence the podcast yeah i know <laughs> um and uh but they will they'll just teach you right and that's a it's a cool way to learn being in it and trying to make your way oh yeah and i've had a couple conversations with people where um the people mistake the grumpiness for them just being a, um, a grumpy guy yeah. but we're talking people who working 18 hours day after day if you catch them on a friday at three in the morning <laughs> transport guy yeah. he might not it's a good chance he's not going to be friendly right yeah. or be okay you know so um there are those grumpy people for sure but there's not many i find no. a lot of, and and they get weeded out yeah yeah i meant more like they look grumpy from afar right. i mean the thing about them is they're all softies because <laughs> you have to have a generally good personality too to be around that many people for that many hours a day oh yeah Right. Like, and it, what blew me away is how many women sure. are in the industry here. When I first started, I, right. I, um, my friend Shannon, who, uh, um, is works for as vice president of uh, women in film. Mm -hmm. She, uh, when I was talking to her about it, that I, I was telling her that over half of my bosses have been women. Right. And the people I work with is usually the team is there's two guys and five women. Right. And it's not, uh, um, it's not, a thing in Canada, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say all Canada, but in Vancouver, it seems to be, um, there's no uh, holding women back because of their gender kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's true in most cases. Um, obviously, it's really skewed department-wise. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to find a woman gaffer. Right. Um, there's not a lot of women DPs out there. Um, they're coming up and they're, they're getting their chances, but in those more traditional male roles, it is harder to rise. Um, right. and the, I think that the trickiest thing about women working in film and television is they, it, it's hard to have a family and then a big career. And so there's always finding that balance where, you know, if, if, if somebody does want to have a kid and they're in the top of their game, you know, what's going to happen if I'm out of the industry for nine months and I come back, is anyone going to remember my name? And I think that really freaks women out in some instances. Right. So they'd rather stay at a lower level. Or if they're in a management position, then they can juggle that situation where they have good people working with them that will you know, support them through that kind of stuff. Um, it's getting better. I, I still think yeah. that there can there definitely could be more women. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I've never uh, experienced, but that's just me. I mean, I don't yeah. know if it doesn't exist, of course, but uh, um, as far as I've been, it's been really uh, open as far as men and women. There's no, it's, it's, you're an ALM. It doesn't matter if you're a guy, girl, transgender, sure. black, brown, Asian, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. You, you do the job. And if you don't do the job, we'll get someone to do the job. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what they are either. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Especially in a department like locations, which is really rough and tumble. It really comes down to, you know, who you are as a person more so than, you know, what sex you are, or what your background is. Um, but some some departments are a little different. I would say they're a bit more sticky. But um, I think that's, you know, it's all changing. It's just so, slow. Did you go to film school? Um, I went to college, Sheridan. Um, okay. It's in Oakville, uh, outside of Toronto. So they had a really good media arts program. So it's a mix of film and television there. I learned how to load a film camera. <laughs> <laughs> and so film. useful right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I put that on every day. resume now. I'm like, I can load a mag in the dark. And people are like, what's a mag? I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, so it was a three-year program, um, and it had an internship in the second half of the last year. Um, so I, I, that's when I started doing music videos. I was working for a woman. Um, I sort of started the first couple months filing paperwork and then I was producing music videos before I graduated. Wow. High school. Nice producing. Well, in that world. Yeah. It's but, a, but it's good education. It's good to like know what you're doing. I mean, <clears throat> I never thought that you needed to know all of these jobs when I first started right. until I did my own indie. 
Right. Yeah. And then one then it's like, oh, I better know every job. Yeah. Yeah. Because if that guy doesn't show up, I have to do it. Yes. Then that's exactly. Then I'm the, the gaffer. Then I'm the, the crafty. School of the hard knocks, right? Like when I'm pulling wardrobe from my own closet or like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Making craft in the middle of the night. I, you know, I've done every job um, for sure at one point or another, um, or at least been close enough to see what it's like. It's it's interesting when people go to film school and they come out and they're like, I'm a director, and they like don't know what a C stand is, or you know that's painful. Um, some people are made for that and I, I totally respect that. There's, there's a lot to be learned about theory and film and I wouldn't put myself in that category of being a director, but I was always interested in the logistics and behind the scenes and getting the person to be where they want to be behind the camera as opposed to directing. Right. Instead of worrying about the, the story itself. Yeah. Just more uh, not that the... I don't care about creative because I absolutely do. You, Everyone, it doesn't matter who you are on the crew. I think everyone has a little bit of creative in them that they yeah. let shine. For and sure. it can be, it can, like could have nothing to do with the actual story. It could be creative on how you do your locations. Exactly. <laughs> creative on how you do your art department or whatever. Uh, yeah. I've thought of some creative ways to drag washroom trailers across frozen lakes. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. you know, create something out of nothing. I'm like, this parking lot looks like dark, dark rainforest to me. Let's <laughs> let's go. Like, you have to be creative, obviously, with logistics as well. And I think that's the thing that keeps people on their toes and keeps people into like in the industry. If it was boring oh, yeah. and it was long hours, it's like who would be doing that for twelve hours a day? <laughs> yeah. No, I know. It's. Uh, that, that that's the other thing it takes a certain type of person with this with the uh, passion and then the drive then love to do what they do and that's what kept me there because yeah my first day i, I only did 12 and i thought it was hell yeah. 12 hours <laughs> oh my god and standing the whole time of course of and course. uh and then when i really started getting in the industry and started working the 16s and 18 hour days and then it's just, oh my god you have to really love what you're doing otherwise right. you'll be weeded out you can't do it yeah yeah and, and that's, you know, starting in music videos, I think my one of my longest days was 36. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Was, I stood for like 22. It was like a hip-hop video in a club. Wow. I, I remember coming outside and it being light outside and me being like, oh, God, when is this over? <laughs> no doubt. Wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I didn't last long in music videos, obviously. Um, but, uh, and then I went into indies and I, you know, did the same thing there, but there at least there's more structure and creativity. This is all Toronto script. still? Yeah, back in Toronto. So it's an indie world? Um, yeah, I worked a lot in, um, Northern Ontario actually when I okay. was there because they introduced a tax credit, like an incentive to shoot in the North. So some of the first, um, independent features I did were in in and around the northern Ontario, Sudbury, North Bay. Okay. Um, which were all, they're good learning experiences. Again, it's hard to get crew to leave their families and go up north. So it tends to be younger people doing those jobs, but they're great ways to get your feet wet. Um, and and it helps, you know, harbor this domestic production there, which is, you know, it's, it's quite a bit stronger in Toronto than it is in BC or um, for the most part. Um, not in every instance, um, but, you know, having that opportunity to kind of get your feet wet on these indie projects is, is, is really key there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the only thing with the Toronto uh, is the winter. People can only <laughs> film at certain times or they are in the studio. Or you're filming in the middle of a frozen lake and you need it to be winter. Right. Really cold winter. <laughs> yeah. And being a, being in locations, being a PA or anything out there, or any department, yeah. forget yeah. it. You're yeah. out in the freezing cold. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I've had some cold days. You know, days where you like change your socks like four times because you're like either your feet are too hot and sweating or your feet are too cold and sweating or <laughs> wow <laughs> in out in out in your in your truck out of your truck in your truck out of your truck and then I'm like oh gosh I just need one 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 minute of sleep and I think I should be good to go and I like close my eyes and walkie goes and I'm out <laughs> wow how, how long did you uh, work in the industry in Toronto or in Ontario um well it was, that was basically my whole 10 years because um oh. when I relocated out here um my husband works in film as well and uh he took a producing role um and so I decided to quote unquote retire from um set life at least right um because it's hard when both people, uh, both partners are in the business, yeah. as you know, because it's like, well, I'll get a job and then he has a vacation and I'm full time and he's and you never see each other for obvious reasons. Um, we were really lucky before we left Toronto. We were working on the same show 
um, for quite some time. And that was really great. Once our vacations aligned, we felt like normal people. <laughs> but that's the only thing. Like in the actual work, you probably don't see each no, other much. No. It's more just the yeah, yeah. hiatus see each time. Other, like, yeah. On set or anything like that. It was just being, you know, having that time where you could pretend to be a normal person was like really key. So when we moved, um, I decided to sort of take a little break and retire for a bit. And uh, uh, that's how I ended up working here at the Film Commission. Um, I went down the garden path. I was like, I'm a Pilates instructor. I'm like, now I'm a sommelier. And I'm like, I'm going to become a helicopter pilot. And then someone's like, why don't you just do a job that's related to film, but you don't have to actually work on set. And I was like, oh, that seems like that's what I did when I got married. Path. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So that's what And you just uh, outside applied or is this networking or do you know someone here? Uh, I, I was um, uh, one of the guys that was working on my husband's show. We met socially a couple of times and he knew that they needed some extra help here. And he was like, you, you need to go and help these guys out because you obviously have lots of experience and that's what they need. And even though I, I haven't been in the business here for very long. I mean, obviously, it's super transferable. A problem in Toronto is the same as a problem yeah. in, in, in Vancouver. And, um, and at, you know, two years after being here, as you do in film, you, you tend to know most people by, by yeah. then because it's such a small industry. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. That's what, that's what I was saying to Marnie about how uh, um, doing this podcast, I'm hoping to bring in more. It's a family, really. Yeah. There's people I work with for two years and don't see for five. And then yeah. the next thing you know, it's like I saw him yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I work with him for a year again, yeah. you know? Yeah. I've, I've always found that. And um, obviously, you know, my film family back home, um, if, you know, if I just transported them here, it would be the same thing. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I've, I've found that it was a it was a good transition and it makes me feel connected. And it makes me feel like I didn't waste 10 years working in a business right. that, you know, I'll, you know, I don't have any practical skills that I can write down on a piece of paper. I, I know things. It's all right. in my head. It's not something that I've taken notes on or could pass on or to took someone. courses and I've, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I have my master's in, in, in film parking. Or, yeah, like, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I know every type of generator and how many yeah. people you need to lift it. Like there's nothing I can do with that knowledge and it seems like a waste to sort of let it all go and, and, and take the garden path and do something else. And, and, you know, with film, it just it, it holds on to you so tightly and it never lets you go. My, uh, I interviewed a guy, Milton, uh, a while ago, and he came, he told me the term golden handcuffs. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. My and he says the golden handcuffs times. where you make so much money, but you hate your job. You get to a point where you're like, okay, yeah. I don't want to do this anymore, but yeah. I make so much money. I, I make know. 80, 90 grand a year. What the hell? Yeah. You know, I can't walk away. I know. And then you go and be a civilian and you're bored. Yes. <laughs> and that's, that's exactly what happened to me when I, uh, uh, but... I look for a regular job, and then I and then uh, my wife said, "Why don't you apply to places that work with the film industry?" It was the same thing. I'm like, yeah. "Oh, that's a good idea." Yeah. As soon as I went to the people, they were like, "You start Monday. You start three days." Like, "Oh, you'd hire me right away." That's amazing. That's amazing. It was. It wasn't the money, obviously, but yeah. uh, it was the time. Yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden, I could sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you get to stay connected with people um, in that respect. I mean, there's just right. something to be said for. I mean, I don't know if you found the same way, but when you're in the film world, you tend to like lose touch here and there with friends and because you're spending so much time with these film people and you're always talking about film stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get out of film and you're like, oh, there's real people who talk about other things other than their set day. Oh, that's yeah. so weird. I'm like, can I even converse anymore if it's not over walkie? I don't know. I'm like, social oh, yeah. situations? What? <laughs> I didn't have a walkie and it was rap rain. And then you say all the stuff and they're like, what? Yeah. I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, um, and like missing events and stuff. Like nobody ever oh, got yeah. that, right? Like they were like, "What do you mean you're working until tomorrow at three a.m.?" I'm like, "It's just it's gonna be like that." I I'm sorry. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. Uh, yeah, well, one of the advice uh, I got from someone was saying, uh, um, "Never say no when uh, um, you're offered something." If so you're offered a job, um, when I first started too, I got the advice: don't say, "I don't want to do it." Okay. Never say that. If you are if they want you to come work and you don't want to do it you kind of have to white lie and say i'm booked on something else yeah absolutely and i that would be the other advice i would give 
from a perspective of anyone starting out who's like trying to get answers for questions, et cetera, and a director or an AD or anyone asks you anything and they're like, can I put a light inside of that person's store when it's like clearly closed and it's 4 a.m.? Like you don't say no. You're like, let me check. Yep. Right. Even if you know the answer is going to be no, it's always like, hmm, let me check about that. And then you walk around the corner and you fake call someone and then you come back around. And you're like, I think it's closed. I think the answer is no. I'm so, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> There's no no in film. That's ultimately. And I'm sure Marnie has probably said the same thing. It's the reason that, you know, the film industry is has gotten as far as it has is that. You know, we, we push and we push and we get what we need because it's creative. And if you don't drive and, and push for what you actually want, um, it's a flop and it's not interesting. Right. Right. And then, yeah. And, and plus uh, us trying to keep up with the Hollywood. But like they, they say this is the Hollywood North, right? Yeah. And we're growing to a point that it's not L.A. yet, obviously, yeah. but we're at capacity. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like is. Everyone... We don't say we're at capacity. We just say we have to move things around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I say that. I'm a civilian now. <laughs> no, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of people, and for me, actually, at the end of my tar- term in the on set, it was, uh, you know, four of us knew what was going on, and ten worked a week, two days. They didn't know. Yeah. So there's a lot of people getting in the industry, but then the, the people will keep moving up and whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> It's pretty crazy. It was like something like a 30% increase in labor in like three years here. Yeah. And that's massive. I mean, I don't think there's many other industries that had that kind of rapid growth in definitely in British Columbia so quickly. And it's, it's quite amazing what they did. Even when I moved out here two years ago, I briefly worked on a, a show for a little bit. And I was meeting, you know, kids who, for the first time, who'd never seen a piece of cable, didn't know where a set was, didn't know what a washing was, didn't know what a winnie was. You know, they knew nothing. And, you know, I was terrified, first of all, that these <laughs> people were supposed to be I mean, doing I have things to tell for you. me. I was like, oh, God, this is going to take a while. I was you like, wish you had my book. And I was, <laughs> my favorite story is that I, I set this PA up. He was watching just like literally cable and I gave him the whole spiel, safety, this, that, blah, 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 everything. And then I was like, is there anything else you need? And he's like, oh, I'd love a chair and some lunch. <laughs> I was like supposed to be the location manager at that point. I was like, you're going to have to wait for that, pal. <laughs> yeah. I was like, there was like a thousand people running around and he was like, he's like, yes, please. I'll have lunch. And I'm like, no, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> so sorry but no and how do you think you're entitled or you're or more important than these thousand people I running mean, around you? i should know better than to be like do you need anything right it's a hypothetical yeah yeah you say that yeah yeah yeah. i mean unless your leg is bleeding you're fine right right or, or yeah and what you meant was do you want a coffee from craft you'll send yes, some over kind of yes, thing more than yes, uh, yes yes but yeah you give someone a hand they'll take an arm yeah, yeah. every time yeah yeah exactly so. And what, uh, what is your story? So what are you doing now? Uh, I'm doing this uh, pretty well exclusively in Amazing. writing my next book. Oh, um, outstanding. I, I started when I first got sick um, and uh, was really diagnosed with the MS thing. Uh, you know, I went from working mega hours, as you know, yeah. in film to doing nothing. Right. And it was really hard. Um, and I was really sick when I first got sick. So I, um, I didn't have as much time to do creative things right. but I started working on this book it took me about a year and a half wow. to actually get it published and it's, it's not amazing. that big it's only you know 80 pages or something yeah, it's more it's of a, a guide. big accomplishment regardless right? yeah it was it was it was also um I was proud of myself for actually completing a book and putting it out there yeah. yes I, I was it was an accomplishment in my eyes because th- I've never done anything like that yeah, yeah um and then I thought you know that's not enough I I put it out there but I'd like to talk to all these people sure. that are in the industry because I know there's so many dynamic and amazing people yeah. that uh, don't get a voice don't get recognition yeah for sure and they need it I yeah. think because there are some really dynamite people I've come across yeah. just unbelievable well, unbelievable well like I said and people in film love talking about themselves <laughs> And, and they have some of the best stories going, right? Yes. Because you meet all these interesting people that you normally never would. Like you can meet someone who's done the same job for 40 years in the same office with the same people, with the same family that goes to the same bar and the restaurant. And, the, and like some people are, you know, creatures of habit. And I totally get that. But the, the best thing that I 
found about film is like you literally never know who you're going to (laughs) meet especially when you're knocking on doors that's right and the characters that come out of it and then you know it's it's always a good story to tell it is and it's uh, something different too being in this industry it's one of those things where you're dealing with different places different people different things all the time and not just the usual repetitive um I don't know. Yeah, like the mundane. The same thing, mundane yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which some people like. So that's why they I do. I have. I remember I explained a call sheet to someone once, and I had to. You know, I went through all the you know call times and what the scene things meant and what the call. And then I tried to explain what pushing a call or pulling a call and how all the people on the list were just you know they'd wait for their call sheets and their call times and that's what time they show up and blah 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 and how long it would take to build a call sheet. It basically take all day if you're working on a full. And she literally looked at me and she goes, I'm stressed out just looking at this. <laughs> She's like, why do people do this job? Right? Like looking at the call sheet. And and yeah, if you look at it from an outside, it's like, it's gibberish. It doesn't make any sense to, to the normal eye. And uh, and I agree. I mean, it's it's stressful. The, the talent it takes to, you know, put together something like that. On a a map, basis. everything. You just throw it together and... Yeah. And it eventually becomes second hat. It becomes not like it's nothing. Yeah. And yeah. when I look at a call sheet, I can just instantly look at, even though there's a million things on there. Yeah. Once you're uh, been in the industry a while, you look at it and you're like, oh, I need to know this, this, this. Yeah. Okay, done. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mostly always just was like, what time is lunch? Yeah. <laughs> it's six hours. Thank gosh. You look at the weather. Yeah. You look I'm at the like, lunch I'm time. like, what time is breakfast? No. <laughs> yeah. I only like to eat. That's also why I got into the industry. I was like, they feed me all day. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, the food is, it blew my mind. Not not till the very end. And then at the end, I'd be like, I don't want anything. I'd be like, I'd tell the crab. I was like, don't come over here. Don't come over here. I'm going to eat this salad. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. I already had this huge breakfast. Like when I first started, eight pieces of bacon. Oh, like for sure. all kinds, just go nuts. Yeah. And then three but hours then later, you do you want a grilled cheese? You, sometimes you don't know when you're going to eat again too. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've had those days where I was like, oh, I was like, did I eat today? I was like, I don't know if I did, actually. And then all of a sudden the pain, like the hunger pangs start. It's like, if you're not thinking about it, it doesn't. And then it creeps up in you. Anyway, that's a boring topic. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, uh, food is a big thing that I think that uh, like draw a lot of people into the film industry, sure. which is strange. You think that's not really a big perk, but it is. Yeah. Especially when you're working, there's all, like working so many hours and there's always something that you can have always. Yeah. And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, okay, I got to maintain this yeah. after yeah. a couple of years. Then it was like, okay, I'll eat one donut. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not going to yeah, sit there yeah. and eat donuts every at craft. Yeah. 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 But it's the same, you know, somebody brings their lunch every day in a little lunch box and they eat yeah. ham and cheese and that's their life. And it's like, when you go to a catered buffet every day, it's, pretty sweet gig <laughs> yeah when they have crab legs and yeah. filet mignon and yeah. like oh my god don't tell civilians that. <laughs> <laughs> those are the big shows though. those are the big money shows yeah. i've also had the ones where every day is uh caesar salad yeah. and pasta yeah and that's it yeah. and that's your lunch yeah. every day yeah. Yeah. so yeah, and then you're like just giving a subway. <laughs> so I, I never got into what you do here. What, what what's your uh, job? Your motion picture. Oh, jeez, yeah. Uh, motion picture so, industry and a, a fair specialist. Yeah, so it's a it's a very fancy title. Um, so the department itself is community affairs, industry and community affairs. Um, we're called specialists. That's not necessarily the the best way to describe it, but we know a little bit about everything, um, and can generally solve most problems. Um, and that would be how I would define the job is that we're sort of the bridge between um, the regular world and the film industry um, in terms of we are first point of contact for the general public. So if they have questions, concerns, how do I get into the industry? Um, my dog ate a piece of equipment that fell off a truck and I want okay. to sue them, like stuff like that. Um, the um, the other part of the job is helping productions deal with the general public as well or deal with... Um, the government agencies that we liaise with, all our stakeholders. So that would be provincial agencies, municipal film offices, um, government agencies just like TransLink, BC Hydro. Uh, we we work with them to create policies, guidelines. Some of our big, bigger projects are, you know, they weren't interested in filming at one point and how to get them back on board and how to make things easier for both sides because as we already touched on, the language that we speak is not necessarily the same as everyone else. Right. 
not to mention the fact that you know a government agency doesn't necessarily work at the same speed as a film crew right so they're like hold on one second i'll i'll get right back to you it might be four or six months before we get an answer and we're oh, like yeah. no 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 i need to know in four or six hours right? right and that's that's a really big juxtaposition and um you know i think the the biggest thing that i've learned in this job which is really interesting is that uh, you know, there's a lot of support here in British Columbia for the film Lots. industry yeah. and people work very, very hard to, you know, keep it successful. And that would be everyone from provincial agencies all the way down to the municipal film offices, like wonderful collaboration across the board. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, Marnie Orr has done really well is bring people together so that when there's problems that come up that affect everyone, we really try to work together to solve them. Um, because again, the answer is never no. Yeah. So yeah. we have to figure out like, okay, if that's no, then what is yes? And how do we mitigate concerns? And, you know, if the owls are nesting there, what if we go over here? Or if you're paving the road tomorrow, what if we switched it and flipped our schedule and then moved that actor? Because, you know, there's always, in general, there's usually a solution to the problem. So um, so we, we try to help both sides. We, we help productions. We help general public. We help our agencies we work with. And um, we're kind of the middleman for that. Um, yes. we could use about 25 more people, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, we're, we're getting by and that's, uh, that's sort of the role in a nutshell. It, it's much like the film industry in that you don't know what your day is really going to be like. So. Right. You don't know who you're dealing with. You don't know what's going yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, we're working on these big files that some are, you know, one or two years long and you know, they're slow and steady pieces that we're working on all the time. But as soon as the phone rings, you know, it could be anyone about anything, really. Right. Um, so that's good because it keeps it interesting and it keeps us on our toes. And, and the more people that understand that we're here to help, the better, obviously, uh, because we like to provide that support because we want to ultimately keep filming sustainable here, which is our real job as yeah. the Film Commission. You know, people are burnt out and we get it. And that's why we constantly have to be reinventing and thinking of clever ways. Like, how do we give back to this community how do we ask this production to show these people that, you know, we're grateful that they're allowing us to work in their space, but at the same time, right. let the production do their work that they need to do in other people's space. It's that really fine line. Um, <coughs> I noticed in uh, Fort Langley, there's, yes. a, there's a place where there's tons of filming there all the time. Stuff that, That's just an example of yeah. different neighborhoods or different places, yeah. but uh, same thing. All You have to appease the community yeah because people get mad they don't want that yeah. i i used to do polling i yeah. used to go around to the actual doors and ask people because we're gonna film late whatever yeah. and run across people that hate film yeah. and then run across people that love film and yeah yeah you can use my driveway for free i don't care yeah yeah well i mean and that's ultimately you know we're <coughs> the, the thing about keeping it sustainable is you know lots of people are like well why don't we just get rid of you and it's like well you could but you know, sixty thousand jobs, uh, uh, sixty thousand people. Like these, these are your neighbors. Yeah. And if you say no to this this one time, you know, Joe down the street might not be able to feed his kids. And it's one yeah. of those things that, it's really about making it less about being Hollywood North and more about being BC Film and Television, right? Right. Because we're not Hollywood. We're <coughs> we're never going to be. Um, because these are 95% of the people who work in this business are BC residents, right? Yeah. We're all in this together. And to keep it sustainable, we need everyone helping. Um, but yeah, there's instances where, you know, it's sometimes it's really hard on residents. And it's all about giving them breaks and finding ways to mitigate those concerns. And um, we're working towards, you know, sustainable filming practices in terms of environmental concerns, you know, more tie-ins for, so we have less generators and we're really on the recycling situation, like recycled bottles. Like it's hard for people. <coughs> like um, actually make it um, <clears throat> uh, something that people want. Yeah. And, and show that we're an industry that cares. Um, but like think of how, how it affects our um, BC's um, economy. Yeah. It's a huge. Yeah. Think yeah. of all these when Warner Brothers and and um, Disney and everybody comes to here and spends money. Yeah. You know they're spending like millions of dollars here. Yeah. And the reason they set up shop here is because they they do believe that the communities do support it. And that's and and as soon as they stop supporting it, that's when we're in trouble, right? Right. Um, because locations are only non-renewable source, right? It's once it's done, it's done. 
if we can't film on location and we're forced into the studios, which as you say, are precariously getting fuller and fuller, yeah. they're not full yet. Um, we have to, you know, come up with more creative ways to be filming and it, BC is filmed as a backdrop because it's beautiful and because people want to be here and see these mountains and scenes and streams the and glorious parks. And yeah, I, I totally get it that you want to take your dog for a walk on Thursdays and you don't want anyone around, but this Thursday there might be a film <clears throat> crew there yeah. for a little bit and then they'll be gone. And, and it's all about, you know, finding that fine line and trying to find a balance because we totally get it, right? Like, oh, yeah. And <laughs> and it's so funny, too. Uh, I've been in situations where we've been um, on a, a thing. We're filming in a neighborhood, and a guy comes out and starts mowing his lawn. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, we can't have it. We're, we're filming outside. This guy can't be mowing his lawn. Can you yeah. go over there, offer him 100 bucks, and just say, can you mow it tomorrow or whatever? Oh, okay. So I go over. I make the deal. Da -da -da, and he's like, oh, okay. He goes in the house, if not eight neighbors come out and start mowing their lawn oh, he calls everyone <laughs> he yeah. called everybody and said oh yeah go mow your lawn they'll give you a hundred bucks and then it was like oh yeah. um so situations like that where you're dealing with um people have dollar signs in their eyes when they see the film industry as well yeah and and, and that does happen i'm not saying all the time but no uh, it does absolutely and and in some instances if you're really disrupting someone for real, <laughs> then then that's where the, the payouts come into play. Um, you know, the, the big thing that we were promoting since the beginning is find ways to mitigate concerns without handing out dollars because right. the dollars become $10 and then $100 and then thousands of dollars and then no one can afford to film there and it might as well be done anyway. Right. Um, we've definitely had neighborhoods that have been um, overspent, I guess you could call it. Um, and people get wise to it if the productions have the money, they usually do it because it's the easiest way to go. Oh yeah. But if they have the time and they've communicated everything properly and you know, if the production assistant had knocked on that guy's door and been like, we're filming tomorrow just so you know, you know, if you can avoid doing any yard work, whatever, or taking him a donut or yeah, a lot of times that's enough. Or some, most people are just like, Oh cool. No worries. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, there are definitely those instances where you, you're kind of held at gunpoint, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, phrase, um, saying, um, and, and those are unfortunate circumstances, but, um, I think people are getting better at knowing that, you know, some, some productions have it and some productions don't. Yes. It also comes down to, uh, knowing your job as an ALM or as an LM to, to know that when you walk into a neighborhood, if you were to go to the local bakery and get, I don't know, 50 $10 vouchers yeah, and say $10 off this bakery that's in your neighborhood and then go around to the people that are right around it, yeah. there's really good chance. They'll be like, oh, no problem. It'll be yeah. so nice because you offered them some little gesture yeah. and that's enough. Yeah. But if you are mean and say, oh, no, we're not whatever, they will make your life difficult, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure both sides, obviously, you deal with, right? But, Absolutely. Uh, and I mean, there's just certain neighborhoods that are hot. And they're, they've been filmed that a lot and they're very wise to it. And, and sometimes it is what it is, but it, absolutely it's, it's about giving contributions as well that are for the whole community as, as a whole, like giving money to the BIAs or doing donations for charities and that kind of stuff I think is really important because it shows that you're giving back to communities and it's not just handing an individual a little bit of cash for right. their time. Those kind of, um, bigger picture things are really important and we support those a lot um a bench in the park or planting a tree or putting flowers in the pots that stuff is amazing and right. most people that's what they prefer it's really not about the money for for most people i mean no one says no to 50 bucks it's <laughs> no but if you say hey greens will redo your uh, front yard yeah, here that yeah. looks like a little rough they'll come in here and do that for you yeah. they're like oh and it would cost them 500 bucks to do but yeah. greens takes an hour to do it and yeah. they're done yeah, charitable do donations and stuff are, are really how we lean towards if we can. And, um, you know, we just try our best. It's, again, it's balance and uh, and communication. Yeah. That's a big one. That is a massive one <laughs> as far as, 
if people don't communicate, then it just goes down. But that's with everything, I uh, think. Yeah, I mean, that, that exists in every... <laughs> All relationships. Relationship, every industry. Be clear, don't lie, be transparent. You know, mm. you, you might not like this. This is, this is going to be a little rough. Are you sure you don't want to spend the night at a hotel? Yeah. You know, where, where's your dog? He might be scared. We should take him, like... You just got to be really honest with people. And, and when you communicate properly and you're forthcoming and available to talk. I mean, that's the other thing too, is sometimes you're in an instance and you can't pick up your phone and mitigate yeah. someone's concerns, but that's what we're here for as well. Right. We're like the second line of defense. I can't get a hold of anyone. And I, I'm not sure if I can get someone to pick me up and I'm a little old lady and yeah, I need yeah. to go for lunch. And I'm like, that's, that's what we're here for. So that there's always someone on the other end of the phone. So people don't feel like the film industries out there are like cowboys um, doing what they want. I think everyone oh, yeah. needs to be accountable, and and that's what we uh, we hope to achieve and bring to the BC. Because obviously, this is this industry is not going away. As far as what Marnie says, it's not going away. Everyone was all worried and panicky. Well, it's not the Wild West anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, it used to be. It would dry up. There'd be no work for anybody yeah. for six yeah. months, kind of thing, and then all of a yeah. sudden, an overload. But now, well, it's been just. Going, I mean, the going. way content is going, right? I I don't know if you. Have you ever heard of Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Apple and just streaming. Yeah, yeah. And people are taking in this content like never before. So it's just a surge all around. It's it's It passed around from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, but that's why we need to remain competitive. Like, yes, the work is here. But if we don't work really hard to keep it sustainable, keep our communities happy, keep our crews educated, keep, um, you know, our our at like our environment pristine like we need to all work together to maintain it otherwise they will they'll just pack up their bags and go to atlanta yeah exactly and that's uh that's what we want we want like a sustainable job creation um industry here um uh, for a long time to come i believe it's going to be i i don't know it's, it's so many people that are getting involved or whatever and if it does say say it doesn't uh take off here like you know i predict um, there is a film industry around the world. It's not going to stop. No, I don't sure. think. Plus, everyone's everyone and their brother are doing content. It's just insane. Yeah, yeah. the amount. But anyway, thank you very much for coming and sitting and chatting with me. My pleasure, absolutely. It's so nice to meet you, Mike. Oh yeah, it was so <laughs> nice to meet you too. I I really appreciate uh, uh, seeing a different aspect of the film industry and um, getting to know it because it's it's all this stuff interests me. I for really sure. enjoy it. For sure. Well, um, Julie will shed some light on more of what we do i hope and uh thanks for your time no worries okay we'll take care and uh hopefully talk to you again soon sounds good all right bye-bye that was great um my next interview is with the location consultant at creative bc matthew perry and uh it's very informative he talks about different parts of the world uh with filming and uh, i love the interview so here you go here is matthew perry and we are speeding. Hello, Matthew. How are you doing? Excellent, thanks. Very good. good. Uh, you might want to hold it a little closer to your mouth. I don't know. I can't. Uh... Like really quite close. Yeah, maybe that's. How's that? That's good. Okay. That's good. It's just because the echo of the room. Yeah. It's not very big. Anyway, anyway, how are you doing? Excellent, thanks. That's great. Uh, I just wanted to uh, start out by saying thank you for doing this. You're welcome. I appreciate it. I, um, I'm going through and interviewing a bunch of people in the film industry. Great. And uh, I... When I asked uh, Catherine, she said she would ask around, and um, you know, some people, some fine folks around here said they would do it. So I'm really excited to come down and see what you guys are about. Sure, happy to help. I um, learned about you guys from uh, someone I interviewed, who nice. was the vice president of um, Women in Film. Yeah, and she said to uh, talk to you guys, and and so I looked it up online, of course, and I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. So uh, I looked on online and. Um, you you uh, work in location development? Is that what it is? Well, I'm a location consultant. Oh, location consultant, that's my, sorry. That's my job title, yeah. I'm a location consultant for the province of uh, British Columbia. Nice. And what does that entail? Well, my job is to encourage production to come to British Columbia and to support production that's already here. So my most of my day is spent actually reading scripts. I have a very... Nice job. I'm very lucky. I read a lot of scripts for oh, productions nice. that are considering coming to BC. Right. And then I have conversations with the producers who are 
have sent me those scripts about the locations that I think might match the needs of that script with what we have in BC. I see. So you, yeah, you look over the different uh, different things they need for the backdrop and yeah. and decide whether it's a desert scene or it's a beach scene or it's a whatever. Exactly, and even more specific, you know, in terms of things like houses or hotels or bars or restaurants. We have a database here. We have a database of some twenty something thousand different properties wow. across the length and breadth of the province with about half a million different images. Okay. And so I kind of tap into that database and I build a, a locations package of things that I think would meet the needs of that script. And then I send that digital location package back to the producer and we kind of keep the conversation going from there, ultimately with the hope that they will end up bringing that production to BC. Yeah, and that was, and then you also uh, um, like help out with stuff that's already here or producers that are already here. You grow relationships with people that have filmed here, and then of course they yeah. give you a call and they say, "Hey, yeah, yeah." So there's lots of returning production to BC, lots of productions that keep coming back, or or producers that are familiar with BC already. They've shot a couple of things here, but they want to bring something else in new. So there's all different kind of levels of relationship that we have with these people. Okay, great. Um, and uh, uh, how long have you had this job? Me? I've coming up on three years now since I've been in this particular role, yeah. Okay. Have you been in Vancouver very long? I've been in Vancouver for about eight years. Oh, nine, okay. nine years, yeah. Nice. So uh, what I usually do is start out uh, where you started to get in the film. Sure. And, and, uh, and, and where were you born, first of all? Um, I'm from the UK, as you can tell by my accent. I'm from Wales. You're from Wales. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And uh, did you work in film there? I did. Um, that was obviously where I got my start. Uh, I'd wanted to work in film and TV from quite an early age, but was dissuaded out of that for various reasons for a, for a period. But then, um, yeah, ultimately I, I, I got a job working for a PR company. And at the same time as I was working for that PR company, they were in the process of setting up a, a film commission. Oh, okay. And so I kind of transferred over to that film commission as it became a, a separate entity all, all by itself, looking after and representing Mid Wales. Nice. And they have like a commission in each big part? Is that, yeah, yeah. Okay. In Wales at that time, there was, it, was, it was three separate sort of film commissions. But ultimately, over the 10 years that I actually worked for that organization, it evolved and it became one big film commission oh, okay for wales yeah oh so so yeah that was the uh wales screen commission that, that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Ten, and you were ten, or 10 years yeah i think it was about 10 years that i was there yeah. wow that's pretty big yeah and then from there you went to la yeah yeah I ended up working um for the uk film council as it was then now it's the british film commission um so it's had various situations over the over the last few years but yeah i worked there for a a few years again in the, the UK Film Council satellite office in West Hollywood. Again, assisting production, production that was thinking about going to the UK, but we were literally on the doorstep of all the studios there in LA, and we, so we just have the ongoing conversations with producers there about, about filming in the UK. Nice. So um, basically you just had... Uh, the, the, the internet was around during this time, obviously. There's like... A, so you had like basically all these different locations you can show producers when they came in and saw you instead of them just calling and yeah yeah it was kind of um because particularly in los angeles because of my background in the uk and having worked there in wales for 10 years but also being familiar with the other areas of the uk and the other i forget 20 something film offices that were at that time oh, wow. so I, I i you know in 10 years of working for, for the Wales Screen Commission, I'd become quite familiar with these other people in these other film offices across the length and breadth of the UK. Okay. So that was kind of a useful skill to have when I was in Los Angeles because I could talk with producers and be able to say, hey, I read your script, I've looked at your project, and I really think this would be a good fit with... Call Bill in yeah, we're well, Germany or yeah, <laughs> well, perhaps not Germany, but because I was representing the UK. But, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But Sorry. but but I'd be able to say, you know, this would be good for the northwest of England, or this would be good for um, the southeast of uh, England, or this would be good for Wales or Scotland or whatever. So it was kind of representing all of the UK there. 
Nice. And was it big? Was there big films and stuff? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was some some big stuff that we had conversations about, and you know, they, they, there was lots of production discussions as well regarding kind of the infrastructure in the UK because you know it's, it's, tr- the UK has a good tradition and history of filmmaking going back a long time. And so there's a very well-established infrastructure in place. And so a lot of the dialogues will be about um, studios, for instance, you know, and uh, the crew situation or availability of this or that or whatever. So, so it's, it's, it dialogues were all, all about different things all the time. Oh, yeah, all the logistics about yeah. uh, actually filming there. Exactly, yeah. And I, uh, what is it like in England as far as... Um like I know, there's differences from from North America. Mm-hmm. I know every city's even different as yeah. far as some slang's similar and the same, but a lot is different. And there's a lot of uh, um, different things. Like this is what I heard in England, they don't have crafty craft service. Yeah, is that true? Um, the, it's still there. That kind of particular, um, you know, the crafty is is still there, but it's we don't call it craft services i forget now what do we call it instead there's a different oh, okay. title but this th- th- as a concept it's there but it's often often handled um by the same caterer as well it's not as always, the meals as the meals it's not always a separate kind of entity okay in my experience that might have changed okay yeah no i just heard this from other <laughs> people who worked and went over there and they're like oh what's going on it's not the same like they were yeah no there are there are kind of differences definitely um but I hadn't really thought about that. There are different things, yeah. Like what? Um, what about hours for filming? Do they just do twelves? Do they? I think it's more or less the same as here. Okay. Um, yeah, it's you know, it, not one of those things that I'm super familiar with now. I feel like I've been out in the UK yeah, for a you've while. Yeah, been there a while. These, yeah. these these things change over time. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, so when you were uh, you you got the you went to uh, Langara. It says for documentary film production. Yeah, yeah, just just to explore my own kind of creative channels for a for a while. I I did a diploma in documentary filmmaking there. That was something I'd always been interested in, and I did that program for a short program only for a few months, but it was great. Okay, terrific. Yeah, nice. And that that was when you first moved here to Vancouver. No, or? that was after I'd been here for a couple of years. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'd done various things, but uh, that was one of the things I did for a few months. Yeah, just to kind of. Uh, just to challenge myself and learn. A, it's always good to learn something new, right? Oh yeah, no, that's. There's a lot of differences as far as television and film and documentaries. That each one has their own kind of um, way to go about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, did you do any indie documentaries or work on documentaries after that? I did. I did do a couple. Um, one of which was quite well received and ended up uh, screening in Doxa. Oh, nice. So I was very pleased with that. Um, but but since then. I really need to pick up a camera again and get going, <laughs> get some of my own creative stuff going again. Yeah, that's definitely been uh, something I need to do. How did you uh, get the job here? Um, I had was aware of Creative BC for a while and had been in touch with them. And I think it was uh, just timing, you know, and, and applying for the job. I saw the role. Um, I think I, by that time, been living in Vancouver and for a few years. So I was getting more and more familiar with BC, I was able to demonstrate my knowledge of the prom- province. So mm-hmm. I think that was kind of a contributory factor anyway. Nice. It wasn't like networking. It was like just applying here. Um, it was It was a little bit of both. I'd actually, oh, okay. there was some networking and I'd been in touch with B- Creative BC for a number of years. In fact, even before I left Los Angeles, um, I was initially introduced to some of the team here. Uh, but it was just a matter of an opportunity, I think, uh, coming up and, and and it being a good match nice yeah i uh i worked in a lot of uh big films at first yeah and then i got into the tv world and uh, uh which seemed a little more um it was a lot more work yeah it was like yeah it was 10 months of of constant go 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 mm-hmm. uh, but it was a little more 
I wouldn't say lax because it was really hard. I was working long hours yeah, and doing yeah. stuff, but they let you sit down. They were a little more uh, relaxed about the rules and stuff because mm -hmm. they know that you're working for them for the next eight months kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. So have you ever worked with television or anything like that? I have done work, some work with TV. I mean, my production experience is actually pretty limited. I'm always upfront about that. Yeah. Uh, my background is very much from the kind of economic development film commission aspect, that particular angle. Uh, but that said, you know, I do have some production experience and particularly in TV for, I worked with Shaw TV for, for a little while there nice. in, in Vancouver, which was, you know, that was a wonderful experience. I discovered quite quickly that television, particularly live TV, working on shows is very hard work and very demanding oh, yeah. and draining. Yeah. And so, so that was something I was really pleased to have had the experience to be doing for for a while, but I was also quite happy to leave it. When yeah, it was too much almost. Like it was could cool to learn, but well, yeah, it's you know, it's it's I I was by that time I was getting on, and I just felt like oh, this is really a young person's game. Yeah, yeah. When I first started doing production assistant, uh, uh, I was. I was already late thirties. Yeah. So when I started doing, I'm like, oh, this is young person's game. Same thing. I was yeah. like, oh my god. And I went till, I don't know, mid forties, and I, I just yeah. couldn't do it anymore. I got married and stuff, and I was like, but if when you're twenty, yeah, you can yeah. stand for days. No, you know? I, th I think so. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was I was in my forties by the time I'd started working with that kind of live TV environment, and it was, it was fun and dynamic and challenging, but it was also incredibly draining and there's just so much going on at any one time it was uh just go 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 yeah yeah you know, lots to think about lots to observe lots to communicate yeah that's neat i i'd love to check that out for sure that that world i i've only ever worked in television as far as uh, episodic mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. kind of thing i worked in supernatural and arrow a bunch of big, oh, big nice. shows and uh yeah um but that kind of thing is yeah like i said episodic and it's very different there's no live yeah. live has got to be really challenging because now that I've been doing this for a while, I know you can really screw up and you can't go back and edit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like no, absolutely. It. Absolutely. So much going on at any one time. So many things happening in all different directions and the communications between the upload center, outside broadcast unit, plus the gallery, plus the studio, you know, everything at once is, it's a lot to take on, but it was fun and exciting, but I'm also pleased to be <laughs> where I am now. Nice. And you love this job, obviously. Yeah, this eh? is a terrific job. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I get to travel around the province. That's another nice. part of my job. So uh, I, as a location con consultant, we get to go to, there's eight different regional film commissions throughout the province. So we kind of go and check out those offices every now and then, and we meet with the, the local regional film commissioners and they take us around for a day or two and show us some things we haven't seen because, you know, we're always... Like new locations that you... New locations or things that have just come online or things they might have just discovered or mm -hmm. have become available. So, yeah, it's great, you know, as, uh, to get out of the office and to be able to do that as well as, you know, my, my time in the office. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy that as well. Right. If you're, reading scripts, seeing things that might be coming down the pipeline, might be coming to BC. It's a great job. I love it. But yeah, you go to the Okanagan or you go to wherever it, uh, in BC. Yeah, exactly. That's beautiful. That's a, that's awesome. I worked in locations too. That was my mm -hmm. thing. And, uh, um, I would prep and I'd get all, you know, I got to know the liaisons yeah. and stuff. So you deal with liaisons and with the LMs. Yeah, a yeah. lot of the time, like producers will talk to you initially, and then LM to kind of take over. Yeah, yeah. Often we'll facilitate that introduction. What if it's a producer that's perhaps not so familiar with uh, BC or Vancouver, then we can help point them in the direction of, for instance, the Directors Guild of Canada. Right. Uh, how to find a location scout? How to find a location manager there? So we kind of will have that dialogue, and then there'll often be a, a something of a Passover. Uh, of the information, the location package that I might have prepared initially for the producer, you know, that will, he, the producer or she will hand that over to the new location manager that they've just hired and that location manager might come back to me with questions about what I've included or why did I think that or uh, could you tell me a bit more about why that works or whatever, you know, we, that, that dialogue can continue for the, for the duration of a shoot. Yeah, because if some location uh, doesn't work out and you have to change location last minute and stuff, you exactly. would be able to uh, accommodate that yeah. Yeah. and say, hey, 
I'm in trouble here yeah. kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, and that's one of the things, you know, often once the production has moved on, we don't hear quite so much from it unless something does start going a little bit awry for whatever reason, and then we're here to be able to help that LM location manager meet or find whatever else it is that they need because, you know, a location's just gone down or fallen apart or whatever. Nice. Cool. So, um, do you like which which do you like the best? Do you like LA or uh, UK or Vancouver? For is is each one's different on their <laughs> yeah, own, or like all... is one more like uh, irritating and one more easy, or is does it make a difference? They're all the same. They they they're all definitely different. But I I would hate to pick a favorite. I mean, right. I do miss the UK a lot. I love BC deeply now, and I love seeing the new things that I get to see here, particularly with the touring around and finding. Oh, you saw some beautiful stuff. I exactly, <laughs> I'm so lucky, so privileged to be able to get to these far flung corners of BC sometimes. But also, you know, I still get to go back and forth to Los Angeles every every now and then, either or very occasionally with work or on personal trips or whatever, because I've still got lots of friends and people there, contacts, and even even family down there as well. So that's. So it's nice to be able to kind of do all three, really. Move oh, around. yeah, for sure. I, a lot of L.A. Uh, stuff films up here just because of the dollar. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. um, because also Vancouver can do sand, beach, or B.C., I should say. You could do desert. You can do yeah, we can forest. Do, you can do all kinds. We have so much. I think that's definitely the key to the strength of the, the film industry that we have here. One of the keys, anyway, is the, the v- rich variety of locations we have. You know, it's so versatile and we can look like so many different other places. It's, it's so, so versatile. Yeah. It's what really wild. Um, uh, when I worked on supernatural, that yeah. was like a road show and it was always somewhere different, but of course. how many different places can you have over how many years is it? 13, yeah, 14 yeah, years. Yeah. 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 It's amazing what we can do here. You know? Yeah. I was quite amazed by it. Um, do you uh, um, have anything about uh, the, the film industry here that you w- would like to change or anything? Or you like like it as, as it is, as, it, as it's going? Or is there anything that uh, um, you would like to see happen? I think, I think it's great where we are right now. I think we're in a good place. I think that's, you know, from, from what I hear, most of the productions that are shooting here, everybody's sort of reasonably happy and c- confident and positive about the future as well um new studio space is always good that would be great yeah that's what i say too because a lot of places that i've worked um they would just get a regular kind of a, a warehouse that's not meant for filming it's not a stu- like a, a studio or yeah. anything and they wouldn't insulate or nothing and then mm-hmm. they'd film in there and set up their s- stuff and it'd make it way difficult for uh, locations <laughs> yeah yeah so so that's good i'm looking forward to you know improved kind of relationships with some of the big institutions that we have here and and things and it's it just it just we have such a holistic approach to to filming throughout the province you know we see it as everybody can has an opportunity to contribute whatever their kind of role is whether that's as a homeowner or somebody from a, an organization or an institution things like that there's different ways and it that's one again one of the keys to the success here i think is that we do that in BC quite well. Everybody communicates. Everybody's very open. Nobody's too starstruck. Nobody's yeah. too focused on. Um, it's just it's just a slightly different way to how I saw the industry opening operating rather in Los Angeles. Um, you know, we're just we're just a little bit more chill. Yeah, I think so. And it's also there's less people in, and it's an expanding huge uh, business or industry that's just. Right now, I don't even know how many productions are going, but it's a lot. It's it's probably over 50. Oh, There's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's insane. insane. This time of year, it's between 50 to up to maybe 75. You know? Oh, and the other thing I wanted to ask was how does uh, someone go about getting their um, property or their uh, building uh, for filming? Do we appro- do they approach you guys? Exactly, yeah. Get in touch with us. Have a look on the Creative BC website. Um, that's very easy to find. There's a, there's a little bit there where uh, there's a whole sort of section of that website where it's dedicated to registering your property and how to go about that. Um, the, the various sort of ways of doing it are listed there. But if you, if you have any questions, it's just a matter of getting in touch with us. Or okay. we actually have a dedicated library coordinator, Mike Jamont, who looks after 
the entire library and he's kind of responsible for those uh, responding to requests or if people want to have any issues or uh, concerns about uploading to get on your roster and yeah. to be to be a place that's available yeah, he can talk about that yeah oh that's great um is there anything that uh, um like as far as renting your stuff out you have to own the property for one that's mm -hmm. one of the uh, um, things you need and um when i worked on supernatural they would say no apartment buildings there was there were certain things mm -hmm. that they would not film in because of all the stuff that went with it yeah, it can be. It can sometimes be more challenging, or if if you own a condo, for instance, you know, because you it depends. Every condo is different in terms of the agreements that they have in place between the the board of the condo or the representatives and and the owners of the building and the owners of the individual apartment. So it can vary. We I wouldn't want to give a kind of a blanket no to that because we right. do have a lot of those kind of buildings registered with us. Oh, okay. And lots of filming does happen in, in those kinds of buildings too. So it's not an impossibility. It is just something to be aware of if you are a condo owner that you know it can just sometimes be a little more challenging. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I'm sure the production of Supernatural, that was their rule. It wasn't like all productions have that so no, that no. does exist i oh. just oh nice okay cool nice. well thank you very much for sitting down with me and hey, you're uh, welcome. No problem. um discussing this because to see it from this other side I, I didn't know anything about it i didn't really know um much about creative bc except for what i read online right and uh and being in locations it's really good to uh find out you know the other side basically of what it is because you know that's above the certain line when you're talking to producers you're talking to lms you're making deals with them when you're a PA or you're the office person, you don't know anything about that. right? <laughs> and, uh, it, yeah, it's good to hear. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, uh, I enjoyed this talk. Me too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. All right. And finally, my last interview is with Julie Stangland, who, uh, worked in locations for quite a few years and, uh, is now the motion picture industry and community affairs specialist, just like Catherine. And uh, she has a lot of really cool stuff to say as well. So here you go. Here is Julie Stangland. All right, we're, we are speeding. So uh, thank you for doing this, Julie. I was, I'm really appreciative. Um, this is, uh, I, I like to talk to people on the other side of the film industry, especially the people who have been on my side of the film industry in locations and actually worked on set and know what they're talking about um, because it is such a grueling thing as far as hours and work and it, it's also um, knowing all the things that go with it all the different slang terms and all the different uh, uh, what you uh, what it entails basically anyway thank you you're welcome I'm um, happy to be here I, uh, I, I wanted to start with um, how did you get into film first of all where did you come from where, did, where were you born Oh, uh, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, okay. and then we moved to Edmonton, and my mother is from New Zealand, and she finally was tired of the snow, and she said, we either move to New Zealand or we move to Victoria. Oh. My father was like, let's move to Victoria. So we did that, and then, um, yeah, I moved to Vancouver in 2000. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, had you worked in film before that? A little bit. I had some weird, random set dressing gig that I barely remember. They were filming at this little restaurant around the corner from the legislator buildings. and somehow, In Edmonton? No, no, in Victoria. Oh, in Victoria, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, and they needed a tablecloth sewn for the tables or something along those lines. And so I don't, I have very, I don't, I don't remember much of it at all except for trying to sew these bright tablecloths and not really understanding what the heck was going on. <laughs> and uh, so, so, and then you came over to Vancouver. How did you get involved in the, in the film industry? Did you go to film school? I did. Okay. I went to UBC. I went to their film production program there. And then that's how I got in the industry. I had been working in restaurants for quite a long time and trying to figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to get in. And then I decided to go to school. And UBC gave me the opportunity to start to build uh, a network that I didn't, I wouldn't have had otherwise. Right. So um, I met a number of alumni from the program, and one of them one day, a location manager named Michael Gazettas, uh, we became friends, and he called me up one day, and he said, uh, "Do you think you could 
make maps for us. And my first degree at university had been in graphic design and I did a little bit of graphic design on the side here and there as I was working in the restaurant industry. And I said, probably, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. And um, show me what you need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What does that look like? And uh, he said, well, you know, my ALM, her computer died and she lost all her maps and now she's on a Mac, so a PC and she's just, you know, we just need somebody to do the maps. So I sat at home and made insert maps and crew call maps and nice. that's how I started. Wow. Yeah. And then you started PAing after that? Is that your, or did you actually? Yeah. Um... Well, the next job, the next job was, um, I can't remember the name of the studios. It was the old Smallville studio down in South Burnaby. Off oh, of, uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The one. It was the uh, old Burris? fish. It was it? Or, yes. Well, yeah. no, it was the old fish packing plant. I think it's, I think Burris is right. I think that was an arrow took over uh, half of it. And that was, uh, I know only know because I worked on arrow and on Smallville. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So I think it was around about that time that arrow maybe took over half of it with, I was working um, on a Nickelodeon, you know, movie of the week feature thing. And uh, I just became the studio PA cause they were doing a bunch of set. Oh, nice. So it was just me and a whole bunch of construction and paint. People. That's a sweet gig yeah, for like six weeks. And then I was also doing the maps and then I started doing um, some of the paperwork to do with locations. So I would, you know, I can't, I can't remember exactly what the details were, but like papering yeah. stuff that you would uh, notes for the neighborhoods and stuff. No, more of the paperwork for the municipal film permits. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like they would often send me stuff for the maps, and then I started being like, oh well, also I can fill out the municipal film permit stuff because all of that information was on the maps anyway. So. So you uh, were doing towel stuff right right in the right kind off of the did hop. It backwards. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm getting to know people and da da da. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll try this union thing. And, um, that was pretty fast. Wow. Yeah. I got my office days pretty fast and a decent amount of set days, but they were like, you sort of have the skills to just kind of go into the office. So right. that's what I did. I see. So, so most of office stuff. So the PA gigs were, uh, just a few in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And, um, so when you were in the office, is it, you were just, you walked in as towel, is that what you're doing or were you, um, uh, ALMing? Oh no, I walked in as a towel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sort and of walked in as a towel. Like I would often do running and da da da. I sort run of did a lot of like, yeah, a lot of office PA work in the locations office. And then that was kind of interspersed with the making maps for this one show and da da da. Nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then you moved, you did ALM as well. And then LM, is that what happened? You progressed and moved up? I did not get to LM level. I probably okay. could have when I left the industry. That was when I was starting to get the odd kind of call and question where people were saying, are you interested in LM and do you want to do this? Um, and I had always known that I was not that interested <laughs> in it. Me too. Yeah. It's I a saw big, big job. Oh yeah. And you're answering a lot of questions. You are. It's a lot of pressure. I um, mean, you've got the creative. I, I mean, I was very interested in the creative piece. I still walk around and look at places as though they might be potential shooting locations. But um, the managing of the logistics and the teams and all of that, I just, um, I couldn't, I just couldn't summon enough interest to really apply myself to it. Oh, it has to be worth it because yeah. I, sure you get paid a lot, but I mean. If, it, yeah. if, you, if you're really frustrated, what's not worth it for sure. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's frustration. I think it just, I, I just would have found it incredibly stressful all the time. And I decided I didn't want to live my life that way. Yeah. I only did it a couple of times for independence. And even that yeah. was enough getting permits and doing all the stuff was enough headache for me to go, Oh my God, I'm only doing this tiny little thing. We're filming mm -hmm. two days. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine doing a big show. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. There's so many things that location managers are thinking about simultaneously it's it's amazing when you see when you work with a good location manager it's uh it's incredible what they can achieve and yeah. their job is kind of like if nothing goes wrong they're doing their job very 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 well right but as soon as something goes wrong then everybody notices they're screaming they're, yeah. everyone's like oh yeah. we're supposed to be in there yeah, yeah. wow um, so, uh, I went and I looked at the different, uh, uh, things online and this, this is you online with all these jobs. I don't know. What does it say? Uh, there? you did EBK, uh, uh, uh well, oh my God, production I office intern. That. Yeah. Um, what else? Crafty for short. You did LM for short. Yeah. 
Yeah. You did PA, obviously. Yeah. Uh, set deck, wardrobe, art department, writer, actress. <laughs> you have like... Wait, what's the actor credit? Actor, That's uh, not right. Actress was on... Um, it was the first short and it was on IMDb. Oh, yep. <laughs> no, I you don't even that. remember. It's so funny. Why well, I don't even count it. That was... Um, so there was a time when I first moved over to Vancouver that I met... Um, my ex-boyfriend at the time met a bunch of friends as he was trying to get in to be a voice actor. And a bunch of them were sort of indie filmmakers and kind of doing the small independent stuff. And so they were really involved in like, do you remember the Real Fast 48 Hour Film Festival and things like that? Yeah. So Al Silverman was a writer, director, voice actor, and um, he did a short that I can't remember what it was called, but I basically played tennis oh, in a okay. short film. Or, no, did I even play tennis? No, I think I sat on the side of the hill and was supposed to look sexy or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. <laughs> but, you, but you get labeled as an actress when you really did background? Is that I the idea? so. Well, I had a close-up. Oh, you had a close-up. Okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, no, yeah, looking at your IMDb, I was I was blown away about all the different things you had. It was unbelievable. That's, I never look at IMDb. I didn't know that that said. Oh, I do that. for everyone. Everyone I interview. <laughs> it's so funny because usually they got something on there. Yeah, and, uh, it's true. And then I go to Facebook and they have the obvious, obvious regular channels. But yeah. um, well, that's nice. So uh, uh, five years in the location department? Yeah, and then, possibly. Um, something like that. And how many Crazy Eights did you do? Just the one. Oh, just was, one? Yeah, writing and producing. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. When was that? Mm. Hmm. <laughs> 2012. Okay. Maybe something like that. I was still mostly working in the restaurant industry, and I had sort of come out of school a couple of years prior, and I noticed particularly with the Crazy Eight, so I did the project with um, a few of the my classmates from UBC. And uh, I noticed that the other writer, director, Sean, um, was, uh, he'd been working on Once Upon a Time in the production office, and he had all of these fantastic connections. There was a stunt guy who could help us with, like, the fire in the kitchen that we'd written in. Nice. And there was this and that. The location manager helped us get a location. Nice. So um, it became very, very clear to me that I was not making any connections in the work that I was doing at the time. And so that's kind of what prompted me to get into the industry. And then I had no time or energy left to actually do any independent, more crazy eights. <laughs> yeah, once you start on a thing, yeah, I know. it's... They would call me and be like, are you going to enter anything? And I just, I just couldn't get it together to actually submit anything at the time. Yeah, it was it was a great experience. It was so much fun, and it was like exhausting. Oh, it is for yeah. sure. I I uh, I know I have a couple of friends. I helped out a couple of friends that did that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, in, in the five years in locations too. Um, when you were doing that, um, it was it was ALM you got up to. That was yeah. what you. And that was what you left on. That was what you done before you came here. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. and, and how long you been here? Three years. Nice. Just over three years. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and what exactly do you do? Are you you're the yeah. same uh, as Catherine? We have the same title. I don't know okay. if she told you the fantastic, hilarious title that we have. <laughs> yeah. No, I <laughs> <laughs> motion picture industry and com community affairs specialist. Yeah, it's big. Specialist is the most hilarious <laughs> part, especially since you've now like talked about the IMDb stuff, and I'm like, I'm a jack of all trades, which is kind of what we are. So right. we. Um, I don't know what you're allowed to kind of, you can put anything on here that you decide to, right? Oh, yeah. We like to call the phone calls that we get the you fucking film people phone calls, um, which is... Oh, you mean you're worried about swearing? Yeah, it's explicit. Yeah. You're allowed yeah. to swear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'll just say that again. So we <laughs> like to call the calls that we get the you fucking film people calls. Ah. Um, that's if they're from the general public, right? So businesses with filming around them or residents with filming around them mm -hmm. you know anybody who's annoyed with film people they call up and they're you know they, they say, complain you, to you fucking film people <laughs> yeah so we are part of that um but yeah what that does is actually gives us a talking point to explain to um the rest of the film industry that you know nobody nobody who's who's outside of the industry really understands how it works and collectively we are all one and the same and oh, yeah. that's um, kind of how we approach our work that we do here. So, um, and if I repeat myself, just cut out, or if I repeat what Catherine said, but 
essentially we work with community and industry to maintain relationships and basically steward the sustainability of film in the province. And so when I say sustainability, it's not, um, we do have an environmental uh, sustainability movement called Real Green that um, yes. we push. Yes, Marnie which, talked about that. Okay, great. And then if you get Julie Bernard and she'll talk your ear off about it. She, that's her baby. Oh yeah, she said she set me up with her yeah, to talk to. Yeah, she's too. fantastic. Um, so, but in the community, industry and community sides, we talk about sustainability and stewardship more on the lines of, um, you know, locations are also, they're actually not a renewable resource. They're a resource that needs to be looked after maintained. and maintained. Um, and that includes the neighboring residents and businesses and communities. That so it must be in. frustrating when you have an ALM or someone that burns a location that doesn't care. Because th that does happen. I've been to places where I've been working with ALMs or whatever, and they're like, I don't care. But I'm like, what do you mean? What if the next person comes in here and wants to use this, you know? I think it's changing. I hope it's changing. Definitely with um, the training that the DGC has implemented, a lot of really great training programs. Oh, with good. Kendry good. Upton as the executive director for the past few years because she came from locations. and I worked um, with Kendry. Oh, you did? Yeah. Great. So you know that she has a really strong value system and right. she really understands the importance of your word and your reputation and being able to come back over and over again and often doing your job relies on you being able to come back and being able to come back relies on you keeping your word and maintaining your reputation. So I think that that's starting to really filter down. Um, you know, the, the, the hard part is, is sometimes the rest of the crew also understanding that, um, especially at hour 14, you know, when right. you're tired and you just want to get home and you bang a couple lights around. Oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, you know, or a couple props around, <laughs> or or yeah, or slam you know slam the gate of the truck you know all of these things, or are, or wreck the lawn, or do something where you, I just want to get out of here. I don't care that I yeah. messed up the location. Locations will fix it tomorrow, right? Greens and then will in, do it. Whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in the meantime, you know, the neighbor gets up at seven o'clock the next morning, and you're no longer there to explain what happened or apologize for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they just see ruts in the city grass and some garbage over there and yeah. a bunch of snow blankets left behind and they're mad. So, um, yeah, it's not, you know, I think it's not necessarily always bad attitude, but that's what it looks like from the outside is people just don't care. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's kind of like the nutshell of what we do, but then there's a whole lot of, um, relationships within that, that, um, are, you know, we spend time maintaining them, hoping to improve filming processes and kind of, uh, we have lots of partners. So BC parks, there's, you know, tons of filming in BC parks and we can oh, yeah. them partners and, um, forest lands, natural resources and rural development. They permit, uh, filming on crown land. So they're permits, they're partners of ours that, that we work with to try and see if there's ways we can streamline the permitting process so that, uh, because industry always needs everything yesterday, um, yeah. the turnaround can kind of be a bit closer to what industry needs, but then also, um, ensuring that those provincial agencies and ministries, uh, are able to maintain their own mandate, which is often of public service, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, we do a lot of work like that. We have relationships with PC Hydro and TransLink and all of the, you know, 33 municipal film offices from Pemberton to Hope. Wow. Yeah. Do you guys, uh, um, do, do individual places hire their own liaisons or you, do you uh, uh, supply them? Does it come from here or do you... Uh, um, the I know they liaisons? Go, the liaisons get contracts. Uh, that's mm -hmm. as far as I'm... Mm -hmm. but do they deal with you guys or do they deal mm -hmm. with like uh, like the Burnaby Park, say? I know in right. Burnaby, it's, it's, it's Park Board that yeah. deals with it. But in Vancouver, it's different in different places you go to. Yeah, and Vancouver is just different in general because their Parks Board is actually a distinct um, entity outside of the municipality itself. So Vancouver Parks Boards manages themselves. Oh. They're not managed by the city of Vancouver. So they have their like designated film person Ian Sue at the moment who's fantastic um and the they communicate with the with the Vancouver film office but they process their own permits they manage their own stuff I they see. do their own thing and then of course the parks board has their own parks rangers right that manage everything and I think that is common across the municipalities that you have a you have a parks 
within the municipality and then they have their rangers and so when a production is filming in a park in that municipality um, often there has to be communication with the film liaison to talk to the parks people ensure you know timing and activity and all of this stuff is okay and then generally they will also have a parks ranger there during filming right and the, and the production pays them uh, well, yes, they will pay the city for their time. Because they pay police, they pay everyone who mm-hmm. comes out. Yeah, yeah, the cities will bill the protection for the for those people's time. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the District of Vancouver and the City of North Vancouver and West Vancouver, they actually contract those liaison services out to people outside of their parks. Gotcha. People. So it's, it can shift and change a little bit according to what the municipality, how they manage their stuff. And it's always different, like in Victoria, Northern Island, everywhere, it's always different? It is a little bit different. Well, BC Parks tries to, of course, because they're one entity with, with properties throughout the province, they are trying to manage stuff along similar lines. But, um, you know, depending on where you go in the province, there's different challenges. So the biggest challenge with a lot of those um, agencies in the lower mainland is actually pressure on locations, right? They have their mandate of protecting the parks and maintaining access for visitors. And then there's filming on top of that. Um, so they're doubly challenged with the increase in film production over the past three years. They've also been experiencing a massive increase in visitors over the past three years. Oh, so there's okay. sort of a double squeeze that's happening there um, in the lower mainland. Now in um, the regional areas, they don't have the same volume of filming. So they actually, their challenge is to get enough filming so that the park rangers there um, understand what filming is about and how to do it. Gotcha. So that can be a little bit of a challenge here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's, it's also, um, uh, you get different um, tax breaks depending on where you film. Correct. Right. Uh, if you go, is it 250 second? What's, what's, the, what's the line? Oh, so um, for the, let me just get this straight in my brain so you know how there's the studio zone right and that affects whether or not you get additional travel time on your paycheck that has nothing to do with the tax credit zones oh okay people i got it mixed up the, yeah people that's confuse why. them quite a bit okay. so that's that's an agreement that the studios have with the union that's all labor oriented da, 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 da. however the boundary is really close so oh, for okay. um just your basic tax credit and I hope I don't screw this up because it's not my it's not my department, <laughs> it's not my job. Um, but the basic tax credit is um, the point where that changes is 200th Street. Okay. So almost the border of Langley and Surrey, like it's just within a few blocks there. And then you have what's called a regional tax credit, and that encompasses kind of the rest of the Lower Mainland outside of you know those lines. And I think. I believe that Lions Bay falls into the basic tax credit, but then Squamish is actually in that regional tax credit. Okay. Okay, so that's the lower mainland to Hope. And then outside Hope and then over on the island, so north of Pemberton, east of Hope, and on Vancouver Island is what's called the distance tax credit. Okay. Even though we all called it the regions, it's actually called a distance tax credit. So there's three different. And is that because levels. they have to bring a whole crew with them? That's called distance. <laughs> or um, oh, as far I mean, that's away a, from production office, like or? yeah, right. That would be a question to really talk to Bob. Oh, Long sorry. About. No, that's okay. That's just kind <laughs> just of his curious. his way. I mean, it is it is it can be a challenge for productions because they don't have the same depth of of crew base necessarily so right. you might need to bring over and and victoria and southern vancouver island did at one point and then they shifted those tax incentives and that actually changed their crew base and and had an effect on them so they're back in the distant tax credit now but it is it is to sort of recognize that sometimes there is an additional cost to be out in those regions and also to encourage filming to be in those areas because they also have amazing locations, smart, talented people, and just sometimes need a little bit of encouragement um, on the production side that will help mitigate, you know, those costs that they might experience. Yeah, exactly. Because if you need uh, uh, some stuff from Waits or whoever, PS or any Mm -hmm. of these places for rental and Mm -hmm. you're in Hope, it's far. It's Mm -hmm. like a few hour drive to Mm -hmm. get the one light or whatever you need. So that makes a lot of sense that you would... uh, yeah. Well, and if you're traveling crew, you know, then you have these union agreements that you have to pay them per diem and you have to put them up in a hotel and you have to pay their gas. So yeah. all of those things start to add up. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, 
I've only ever been put up in a hotel once. Me too. <laughs> and just Eureka. Remember Eureka? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was that show. I about Eureka. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Where, where, where did you film? It was in Chilliwack. It was the last day. I just got called out. Because at the time, I think I was doing other shows. It was just a day call. Do they invite you to the rap party because you're there on the last day? No. Darn it. <laughs> and they, they invited me out. And we that that day, I did a 20-hour day. And then, <gasps> then three hours sleep in a hotel room, they had to get me. And then, boom, we had to get up and drive back. So oh, you're giving me a headache already. <laughs> I mean, you don't miss those days, no. eh? Oh, my God. No. Yeah. yeah. I get a whole bunch of stuff where I... Uh, the, the worst I think I ever had was I stood for 22 hours. Yeah, wow. And that was Cannell Reeves' uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Oh, my goodness. And there was 55 PAs, which is insane. I, I worked in TV, so there's always 10. It wasn't like 50 mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then it gets bigger and bigger. And then Jason Cox was telling me about, uh, uh, when the Deadpool was here? Someone was calling, making an order. And they said, Oh, we have 98 PAs today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh my God. How mm-hmm. many ALMs would you have? How many, like that's insanity. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Well, and I think that's cause they were doing like, they had, I, I don't know for sure. You'd have to call on to find out, but, yeah. um, they had booked off blocks for filming on Georgia street. So they were managing all sorts of craziness. And I think that they were down at kind of that 1000 West Hastings block, which um, you don't realize when you walk down that block until you decide that you want to film there. There are so many parkades. Yes. So many parkades that exit and enter onto that particular block. Oh, yeah. It's a tricky one. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot. I've done a lot of filming down there, actually, yeah. uh, for movies and television. Yeah. So have you done independent filming? At all? Uh, a little bit here. Oh, and you there. did the like Crazy kinda, Eights, yeah. Yeah, did the Crazy Eights, and you know, all the student films, and is that's all independent filmmaking. What else? I worked on um, an independent local feature called "Songs She Wrote About People She Hates," which, um, and that was kind of like PMing slash locations slash what else did you guys need to do? Actually, production coordinating was more what it was. Um, yeah, I feel like there's probably other independents in there, but um, it's struggling to come up. Nice. With. No, the reason I bring it up is because uh, I in- I interview a lot of people that are independent, and then people that work in the professional world, mm-hmm. and then work in both. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a world unto its own, and it's not the it same. Is. Yeah. It's it's a. Uh, uh, Obviously, people are trying to get their hours. They're trying to get in and know what they're doing. So they yeah. can go work in the professional industry, yeah. I'm assuming, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. And uh, also have a reel that they can, yeah. you know, like a resume. Well, there are almost two different objectives, right? Like if you're doing independent filming as a filmmaker, you're trying to make your... You're trying to build your resume, right? right you're yeah. trying to make projects. And generally, you have a lot of passion about actually getting them out to the world for whatever reason in terms of content and stuff. And then there's people who are working on those independents so that they can get a bit of experience so that they could then go do that same work and actually get paid for it. Right. Right. I mean, I, I always think it's a good idea, even if you want to be a director and a filmmaker to actually just get on a professional set, even if it's, you know, doing production assistant work. Um, so that you start to understand what the flow of a professional set looks like. Because if you want to be a director one day, you better understand what all of the professionals who are going to be working for you to yeah. bring your vision to life, um, what they actually do and how they do it and what's the language and how should people be spoken to and, you know, all of that. Um, yeah. And, and I think that, uh, I, I think labor is something that can be um, people can get taken advantage of a little bit in the indie world because it's free labor. And I think it's important that filmmakers who want to be recognized as producers and directors um, understand the value of that labor. Oh, and yeah. that they have a responsibility to um, kind of teach and mentor people to learn about the industry. And if you haven't worked in the industry yourself, it's, right. You know, to mentor so I think it's better if they all if the if that independent in the production service world mix more yeah like if they actually like I've been on uh, sets on independence where they don't follow the rules like they're supposed to like mm-hmm. you do in a professional I mean you're mm-hmm. a PA or you work in the professional that you expect it six mm-hmm. hours it's gotta be lunch you know mm-hmm. or whatever whatever the hours whatever the rules is oh and, my god if uh, you're making an independent film and you're not feeding people properly that's like mistake number one that is I, uh, that, that, that's really where I got turned away from LM. I, uh, had LM'd a couple of independents and then I did this one where they took advantage 
large. Like um, they're, they call lunch uh, with a, probably a good four to five hour meal penalty after. So it was like 10 hours. Then they called lunch. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And I was getting mad, right? Yeah. But you have to maintain some cool, right? And yeah. not, uh, and I, and then they were going over and taking too many shots. And then um, we were at Bridge Studio and we had to be out of there a certain time and wrap yeah. out because they were coming in the next day for another production. And um, it's all on my head. It's all on me. And if yes. you don't do it properly, yes. then what? Yes. I'm the one on the hook for it? Yes. That's ridiculous, right? Yeah. And, um, I realized I didn't want the job. I was like, no way I'm doing this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit of a gap sometimes when, when you have people who are sort of taking the hit for you as a, as, as a producer, you don't have the experience or understand what the consequences of, you know, kind of not keeping the time. And, and it's hard because it's a huge learning process for everybody. Right. It is. And also with directing, when you get into, um, um, cause I've directed before and I've been at that place where you're trying to get the shot. You're trying to, you're so involved in the storyline to come across yeah. that you don't, you're not concerned about lunch. You're not concerned yeah. about, even though it is very important that you break at lunch at the proper time you break, you know, yeah. if, within the hour at least, you know, or there's so many things you have to follow because this crew will leave you, especially when you're doing independence, you're not paying them. You're paying them 50 bucks. Yeah. You, you don't have them for ever. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I, I heard a director talking uh, last weekend at Van City at one of their master classes, and he was talking about uh, the collaborative effort that is filmmaking, right? Like if you're a painter, you've got your canvas and your paints, but filmmaking is a collaborative effort. And I think even at that kind of like early stages or independence where you've got these small budgets, um, you still sort of have to have the mindset that it's a collaborative effort and that there is a team with you there and, uh, and kind of operate from that. And that just comes from experience of, you know, time yeah. going on. So, so I think a lot of people, uh, um, when they start as a PA, they really see what they want to do. They really mm -hmm. see the industry from, mm -hmm. cause, because as a production assistant, unless you're on set or unless you're right in with the crew, mm -hmm. You're not doing much. You're, you know, watching door. You're watching some gear or you're watching parking. Yeah, but you got people talking in your ear all day long. Right. With those walkies, right. That's, I learned so much just listening to the walkie and being like, I didn't understand that. And then asking somebody, what does this mean? What does that mean? What are they doing? Or hearing in the walkie and then being like, oh, that's what's happening over there. Okay, I get it. Yeah. You know, I think it's a fantastic learning opportunity to really understand how everybody interacts and like, when's go time for this department and when's go time for that department and really seeing how the uh, mechanics of it work. Yeah, and how it, how it functions, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. Uh, quite amazing to someone who's never seen it before and been on the outside, just yeah. wow, it blew me away. We're finding that set visits are one of the best ways that we can sort of bring partners into understanding how things operate and ah, they really get it. The stakeholders idea. you're talking, people who mm -hmm. don't work in film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah. Once they sort of show up on a set and look around, they go, Oh, okay. This makes sense. Cause you know, when you walk past a set, you sort of get that sense of like, I'm not really, they're letting me walk through, but I'm not really supposed to be here. I'm not really, you know, you sort of get this feeling like I better hustle. I better get through here and step over these cords and around this car. Yeah. <laughs> by crafty. I'm in the way. I'm in the way. I'm in the yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this, this is an opportunity for people to just kind of like actually stand and talk to the ALM and talk to the LM and ask questions and what's this over there. That's that great. There. Yeah, it is. It's really neat. It gives, uh, it gives people more knowledge and uh, they mm -hmm. understand. And Yeah, and I don't know if Marnie used her famous phrase with you, but you know, we end up talking to people who don't think they have anything to do with the film industry, only to discover that they actually have quite a bit to do with the film industry. <laughs> they do. They do. They just don't get paid. Yep. directly by it and how many people in all different departments uh, uh, in mm -hmm. the real world i say you're in construction you do painting you know you can go make way more money in film <laughs> yeah but then you have to work those hours i don't know <laughs> yeah that's true that's true but but it's true and you know i mean you get what's really neat is that the when you can transfer skills like that um to do some really creative stuff that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise right right which is yeah yeah, I think people with an artistic sensibility, but also have those hard skills. Um, I think that's why they really enjoy it. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, I should wrap this up for sure. Yeah, we're, we're getting to that time, but thank you very much for You're sitting out and talking with me. I, uh, 
really enjoy talking to you guys because I see a part that I didn't know much about. And Right. It's another hidden part of the industry is uh, all the people that are, you know, behind the scenes kind of working to keep things moving. Yeah, I, I worked in the logistic part where you actually rent stuff, go pick up, drop off yeah. checks, da-da-da. Yeah. But uh, this is this is dealing with the people above the line, you know, from directors and producers and that kind of thing. Even though you yeah. deal with the general public, you're kind of like the, the, the middle woman mm-hmm. <laughs> or middle man mm-hmm. of uh, dealing with film and the general public. Yep. yep. And that's... Yep, exactly. Well, and all the municipal, provincial, federal agencies that basically are facilitating filmmaking in the province and yeah. how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Be, and, and, and do you think it's because of the economy? Cause it, it brings a huge thing to the BC economy or Canada even is what because of the economy, uh, uh that they uh, facilitate that they, they are ah. still, still going with it because they're like, okay, this is making us money. We're doing actually good. We're bringing Disney. We're bringing MGM. They're spending millions of dollars here. Yeah, I mean, they always have, right? Like, they've always kind of, if you wanted to go film at a BC park 25 years ago, you still needed a permit for right. them, right? right. And um, so they've always kind of been a part of it. It's certainly, I think, it's a lot more of their days and their jobs than they had ever anticipated it would have been a few years ago. Um, and, and now the industry is just here, so it's just trying to figure out how to manage and deal with it and, and kind of find some solutions to making things better on both sides, you know? They, yeah. they, they work, but there's probably ways that, that maybe could work a little bit better. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I, I'm sure as time goes on, they're just learning more. Like the cooperation mm-hmm. by them is key as far as... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't be... I mean, we wouldn't have had Deadpool 2 if it wasn't for the Ministry of Highways saying, yes, you can take that big <laughs> truck on Lionsgate Bridge. You know, like this is... <laughs> This is quite wow. phenomenal stuff that and people are people are doing their best to make it happen within short timelines when they have a lot of other work on their plates that they're also trying to manage. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think there's been a lot of commitment from those people just to sort of make things happen. It's been <laughs> neat. Well, thank you, Julie. It was really good to talk to you. And uh, I I look forward to talking to you again. I'm going to come back here, and I said in about a year or whatever. And I'm oh, also cool. going to attend your uh, location, um, uh, uh, the things that uh, Marnie was telling me about. You have The uh, locations night where the everybody location comes night. and... Yeah. I'm not going to say this because then you put it in. But yes, you should come. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say where everybody comes and complains about you know, <laughs> how hard it is. I won't. I'll come and just... <laughs> and then you'll they, hear good things from me. <laughs> and then they say to us, you know what you guys should do? <laughs> And you're like, oh, we're trying. <laughs> There's a lot of you out there. You yeah. get a lot of that. You know what you should do. Mm-hmm. That's hilarious. Mm-hmm. When I started this podcast, I knew the people in film. There's so many people that love to talk about what they do, too. And I know that this, they'll they just line know, up. <laughs> totally. And they never get to talk about it, right? Like, what costumer gets to actually talk about what they do for their job in a way that, like, might actually reach somebody else? And... You know, getting into the industry is is not the easiest thing to get into. So I think this is great because people who are interested and who are listening might be like, "Oh, there's a tip I didn't know about." And here, right. You know, it's 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 really big as far as uh, reaching those people and getting them to talk because that is so helpful. Mm-hmm. There's so many people like mm-hmm. like yourself who went through all these different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Catherine went had all these hats. She did all these yeah, jobs, you know, yeah. and. Uh, in order to move up like that, it's really cool as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. There, there's uh, Once you learn the skills, then you just get put right into a new thing. And they're like, oh, you want a new job? It's almost like they offer you a job or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. But uh, to get into the industry, that's where it, it, where it is. And hardly anybody has the same story. Everybody's right. found their own path in. It's so different. So it's, yeah, this it looks hard from the outside. Hmm. Okay, well, okay. Uh, thank you very much and uh, take care. You too. Yet again, another fantastic episode. The people at Creative BC are so kind and great. It's, it was awesome. Uh, join me next Monday when I have a conversation with Sandy Gisbert. She is a writer, director, project manager, and producer. She has a lot of hats. Uh, so I will talk to you next Monday, and you guys have a great week. Take care.